All right, everyone, welcome. My name is Jessica Main, and I'm a faculty member at the University of British Columbia in the Department of Asian Studies. I study modern Japanese Buddhism and social ethics, teach courses on Buddhism, and have the privilege to organize uh, events like tonight's virtual symposium entitled The Challenges and Joys of Translating the Abhidharma Kosha Basya uh, from Chinese into English. And this is a uh, Bukyo Dendo Kyokai project. And as you can see, it is uh, being participated in by an international group of scholars who are also located internationally in several time zones around the world. And we're very grateful to have them tonight. For those listening or reading the captions, I am joining you today from my home at UBC's Vancouver campus. I am middle-aged, white, and woman presenting. The background behind me depicts the fall colors and a stone lantern at the Nitobe Inazo Memorial Garden. I acknowledge that UBC's Vancouver campus, the place where I live and work, and where the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation Program in Buddhism and Contemporary Society is homed, is situated on the traditional, unceded, and tra uh, traditional, ancestral, and unceded territory of the Musqueam people, who are currently engaged in struggles for sovereignty over this land. This land has always been a place of learning for the Musqueam people who for millennia have passed on their culture, history and traditions from one generation to the next on this site. We gather virtually from many places to do the same and to learn from one another. Through the generous support of our donor, the Robert H. N. Ho Family Foundation, we support undergraduate teaching about Buddhism and bring a variety of scholars and community leaders to UBC as part of a distinguished speaker series, symposia, and conferences. Tonight's virtual symposium is one of these. Uh, before I uh, hand things over to our fearless leader, Professor Ken Tanaka, I would just like to apologize. Uh, I have been ill, so I will do my best uh, to be helpful, but I apologize if my voice or me uh, isn't so present. So I'm gonna turn things over to him now. Uh, for introductions, and a uh, little bit more about the BDK Translation Project. Thank you so much. Okay. Thank you, Professor May. Uh, my name is Ken Tanaka. And uh, first, I would like to read uh, greetings from the chairman of the BDK, uh, the co-sponsors of the symposium, Professor uh, Shoryu Katsura. Um, so he wrote, on behalf of BDK or the Society for the Promotion of Buddhism, I wish to welcome all of you to this symposium. It is our hope that this event will contribute to informing more about our project of translating the Taisho Chinese Buddhist canon. The translation project was started in 1982, inspired by the vision espoused by Reverend Dr. Ehan Numata the founder of BDK. This is one of numerous projects that BDK sponsors, which includes the distribution of the book, The Teaching of Buddha in hotel room throughout the world and the establishment of endowed professorial chairs in Buddhist studies at 17 major universities in the world. So it is our wish that these projects continue to contribute to the promotion of Buddhism toward greater peace within individuals as well as in the world. Okay, so I would like to now uh, uh, share, uh, introduce a bit about our uh, project. The project is called the BDK English Tripitaka Translation Project. This is the headquarters uh, of BDK in Tokyo. And uh, you notice the, uh, the Buddhist flag and the, the BDK is actually located on one of the floors. Um, the translation is one of many projects and activities that BDK is involved in. Already talked about the distribution of the teaching of the Buddha, as well as the professorial chairs, but there are uh, other programs such as the you know, fellowships for young scholars, uh, a publication of books, uh, awards, lectures, and courses. So uh, there, there, there are about 20 uh, staff members 
uh, at uh, the BDK headquarters. This is Reverend Ehan, Dr. Ehan Numara, who is who is the founder of the BDK. But the BDK is sponsored financially by Mitsutoyo Corporation. It is a micro micro um, measuring uh, precision instrument company that is worldwide and and it is the 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 sole fund, founder uh, the not the founder funder of BDK. Now the the now a little more about the pro project the translation project itself. Um, the aim is to translate the entire Taisho Buddhist canon. It was edited uh, between 1924 and 34 uh, by uh, Junjiro Takakusu and Kaikyoku Watanabe. And you can see a photograph of the, some of the volumes. There are 100 volumes, um, each with 800 to 1,000 pages of classical Chinese. Uh, for some of you are already aware, but the Taisho canon was uh, it was based primarily on the Korean Buddhist canon, and uh, some from Sung, uh, Yuan, and Ming uh, canons as well as long, uh, uh, also along with the Dunhuang manuscripts. So it's a compilation of uh, of of all these different canons that preceded the Taisho Canon. The R project uh, decided to select 139 texts uh, from, from the Taisho Canon to start with. And we are in the first series of, of, of our uh, humongous <laughs> project. Uh, the first 139 has 70 works from India, uh, uh, 35 Chinese works and 34 Japanese texts. And uh, the workflow is that we have already uh, commissioned uh, or selected translators from for all the 139 texts. And the translation uh, takes place after we make the request. And there are uh, two reviews, first review and then academic review. Uh, each time the translator responds, and the, then it goes to the publication committee, which is located in um, Moraga, California, uh, though the editorial committee uh, is in Tokyo. And so it goes through the, it, it goes, they go through this uh, uh, workflow process. This is a photo of the uh, BDK America in Moraga, California, where the uh, publication committee is located. So we have the editorial and the com uh, publication committee. So once it goes to publication committee, uh, we have prof uh, professional uh, editors who do the copy editing and they uh, negotiate or they communicate with the translators. The publication committee is headed by Professor Charles Mueller, uh, Professor Emeritus of University of Tokyo and presently professor at Musashino University in Tokyo. And at the present stage, we have uh, of the uh, seven, over 7,000 Taisho pages, 70% uh, has been completed. So we have 30% more to go, which we would like to do complete within the next 10 years. And this will complete the first uh, series, the 139. So after that, well, it's the next generation we'll have to worry about. And um, so here you see, uh, uh, we publish uh, in book form like this, but we also uh, make, uh, these need to be pub uh, purchased of course, but the uh, PDF for forms of all the translations that I have done are free of charge and they can be download downloaded at BDK website. So please go there if you don't know about them. These are some of the examples of some of the the translations that that are done. Now, finally, so why do we need to uh, need another English translation of Abhidharma Kosha? Well, the one English translation is one by Leo Pruden, but it is not a direct translation from the original Chinese. It's an English translation based on of the Poussin's French translation, and uh, our panel. Uh, feel that uh, 
the French translation does not fully uh, is not fully faith, faithful to the original Chinese. And we will talk about this in our third hour discussion. So if you wanna hear more about our critique, um, please uh, stay on and for the, the third uh, hour. So, uh, and finally, the dream is coming true, which was started by Reverend Dr. Numata in 1982 and uh, when, when the project was started. So uh, in 10 years, we hope the dream will have come true. We like to address two questions uh, amongst the, the panelists. The first one is, has to do with the joys and, and, and challenges of translating the text. And second one is to talk a bit about the fact that this is the first uh, translation into English directly from the Chinese original and, uh, and, and some uh, critique of the uh, French translation by Poussin. So uh, I, I, I thought we would ask uh, each of you to first deal with the first question um, of your challenges and joys of translating. I know uh, uh, Ching Kang uh, 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 referred to this in his presentation, but uh, keep it in, in about a minute of your, uh, your, your what you find to be joyful and, and challenges. And also mention a bit about uh, quickly uh, the chapters that you are translating of the kosha, um, because I, 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 we haven't talked about that. Okay, so we'll, we'll go with uh, starting with the, in order of uh, the presentation. Vivek, could you do that in about a little, within around a minute? Yes, uh, thank you, Ken. Yeah, I'm translating the first chapter, uh, Half in Asia. Uh, of course, it's a pleasure to uh, translate such a prestigious, uh, important uh, Buddhist text. Uh, but the, at the same time, uh, there are a number of uh, issues, you can say challenges. Number one is the style of um, uh, Xuanzang, uh, because we are translating mainly the Xuanzang text. Um, uh, as my colleagues have already said, that he had uh, perhaps Paramatha's text, as well as many other commentaries uh, in India, which perhaps now not available, uh, but many of them are uh, uh, transmitted to his students perhaps. So um, the way he translates is uh, very, uh, in a very um, faithful to the source text. That's the kind of uh, convention he he used, and then um, but he did not leave too many clues for many things. Yes, of course he transmitted to his students, but uh, it's uh, sometimes difficult to unpack some of the expressions he has used, some of the uh, condensation you can say he uh, he has um, employed. So that makes it difficult sometimes to unpack some of these expressions. So that's my experience. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And then Bruce? Um, I, I translate, uh, my task is to translate chapters four, five, and six <clears throat> on karma and anusia, which is Klesha's defilements. And then six is on um, the path and the the fruits of the path uh, as you go through it. I've translated four or five and six, and I've done a little bit from four. Uh, they're uh, both, they're interesting. And what's in, what I found fascinating as I went through them, I, I purposely didn't read too far ahead. Um, I wanted to see what things happened in the chapters and uh, sort of like, you know, did the Butler finally do it or not? Um, but so, but I kept finding that there had interesting twists and turns. Uh, one chapter talks about indeterminate uh, clashes. So there's a big, a big discussion of, is this the same as the indeterminate questions? And there's a whole section on questions in Buddhism and how the Buddha responded to them. So little asides like that sometimes end up being quite fascinating. Uh, as everybody's noted, this can be a very challenging text. And you just look at it and wonder, what in the heck is he talking about? You know, you can translate it literally, but, you know, what's the point? Um, and so you, you sort of scratch your head for a while, um, and then you 
usually find a way to do it at least maybe i just comes to me the next morning after getting up who knows what but uh, anyway and it's a lot of fun to do that you it's, it's kind of for me i approach it like a who done it you know i want to see what happens by the end of the chapter okay thank you bruce uh jeffrey well, earlier I have translated the Madhyanta Vibhagabhasya for the BDK series, which has been published. So I'm familiar with uh, some of Xuanzang's translation conventions. And the most challenging part of translating Xuanzang is that he uses a very terse way of rendering Sanskrit into Chinese. So generally, he renders everything into um, four character lines. And that often requires a great deal of abbreviation of the original context from Sanskrit. So in order to unpack that, just looking at the text itself, sometimes we have to look at Paramartha's parallel translation, as well as the Sanskrit. And in some cases, too, you can see that Xuanzang is departing also from the Sanskrit um, for reasons unknown, or at least according to our understanding of the Sanskrit. So. It is a very challenging text to read and translate, which is also why in East Asia there was a commentary tradition that's quite extensive. But even the commentaries are not always entirely clear either, because it seems um, they were making an educated analysis of the translation, but it wasn't necessarily um, based on the original uh, Sanskrit. But the joy of it is also just the fact that we're looking at a text that was highly significant in East Asia. It was widely read. And also, just given the fact that Xuanzang had experience at Nalanda, and he was quite well versed in contemporary uh, Indian discussions on Abhidharma, his translation is also useful because we can also see an interpretation of very important Sanskrit texts um, from a contemporary Chinese point of view, which isn't necessarily rooted entirely in Chinese Buddhism, but also in the Indic tradition that Xuanzang himself experienced in person in the seventh century. Okay, thank you, Jeffrey. Cheng? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I think the real challenge is already indicated by, uh, by our colleagues, namely we are actually struggling with a huge traditional Buddhist scholasticism. I think that's the root of all the challenge with the uh, kosha. And I will say a bit about the joys. And in my presentation, I already touched upon the joy with struggling with Xuanzang. But also, as Jeffrey uh, just mentioned, it will be even more interesting to monitor how Xuanzang's uh, dif uh, translation differs from that of Paramartha. Because uh, Xuanzang, as uh, Jeffrey just mentioned, Xuanzang always publishes four, four characters, whereas Paramartha didn't uh, adopt that convention. So it would be very interesting, but in you know in in general, my ultimate joys come from my own uh, education because uh, uh, you know my my specialty is uh, yoga chara, and whenever you got the issues with yoga chara, you always go back to Abhidharma. And uh, current uh, recently, more and more scholars uh, of Matya Maga were were suggesting that uh, even Nagarjuna in his uh, Mula Matya Maga Karika. Uh, was uh, debating or criticizing, refuting the main categories of Abhidharma. So I think it wouldn't be an exaggeration to say Abhidharma is the real matrix of Buddhist philosophy. So everyone who is interested in, in, uh, in Buddhist philosophy should uh, have some knowledge about Abhidharma and the Koja is the beginning, the best uh, door into that huge uh, tradition. <laughs> Okay, Chen, uh, you're a great uh, advertiser, <laughs> promoter of uh, kosha. All, I think yes. all of us are, yeah, because it's not studied very much, you know, in Buddhist studies. And uh, all right, uh, Wei Jian. All right. Oh, so on my part, I will just add that <laughs> um, Sanskrit, Sanskrit grammatical expressions and discussions such, uh, uh, such as uh, explanation of the grammar of samasas, the compounds and the case endings, which are, are often related to doctrinal debates and discussions. But in Chinese translations, these sensory grammatical expressions are not easy to spot or even uh, lost in, in translation. So it gives uh, it gives me uh, joy and, and 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 challenges to plow through the Chinese translations word by word, like deciphering some codes. 
And uh, when the hidden grammatical expressions in Chinese translations are identified, I would go, yes, got it. <laughs> That's the experience that I'm sharing. Okay, thank you, Wei Jin. Um, all right, the second question has to do with the uh, our bold assertion that Delavalle Poussin's French translation is not quite up to par, or there are some sections that are not very faithful to the original uh, uh, original Chinese, and uh, maybe talk about the you know the significance of our translation into English. So we'll just do the same again. Uh, I'll be back. Okay. Um, uh, when Valé Poussin started to translate, he did not have Abhidharma Purusha Hashya in Sanskrit in his hand. So what he did was he looked at Chinese uh, translations and the Yeshua Mitra's um, uh, commentary and many various sources. That's why when we when we now translate it from uh, Chinese, especially from Shansan's text, um, what we find is that he has kind of um, he has his own way of translating things, reading various sources, and then he summarized them or expressed them in his own understanding. So um, my understanding is, if he had the Sanskrit text, uh, Abhidharma has this text in his hand perhaps you would not deviate from Chinese or, um, or the present Sanskrit, uh, because he often deviates from them. And we don't know from where he's getting all these uh, extra explanations or why he's deviating. Uh, so um, I would not say he was not faithful because uh, he, he's the pioneer uh, translator. He, he's a genius. I mean, uh, what he did was Amazing, like even today, we cannot talk about course studies without uh, calling his name. He is an extraordinary person that achieved the height of scholasticism that is uh, still unparalleled in a way. Um, but, but at the same time, uh, when we really talk from the point of view of Swansang's text, he deviates in a number of places. And then sometimes it's um, it's a good indicator, but uh, we cannot take him literally. Thank you. Okay, thank you, um, uh, Bruce. Yeah, I, I um, echo uh, Vivek's translation. This is an amazing work, um, and it's a treasure trove of all sorts of things about Abhidharma. Um, I mean, you really do need to look at that carefully. But as a translation of Shenzang which is what most people assume it is, it really isn't. It's only in the loosest possible way that you can talk about that. Um, he will summarize it. He's gotten the argument there, but if you're looking for the language, you might as well forget it. Now, there are places where he does do a faithful translation of Shenzhen. And that's where, in my experience, especially in, like in chapter six, there's a long digression by Shenzhen. It's not in the Sanskrit, it's not in Paramartha. Uh, but he takes that and puts it into a footnote. He doesn't translate it in the body of the text. It's just not there. But in the footnote, he, the translation is really quite faithful. I mean, he understands the Chinese perfectly. He just mostly summarizes it in the body of the text. He also puts a lot of Sanskrit stuff in there. I suspect a lot of that, the Sanskrit terminology uh, for names and all sorts of things comes from Yashomitra. Um, I don't know that for sure, but it just seems plausible. He, he may have had other commentaries as well. Um, and another thing that also kind of frustrated me a bit in the beginning was that he does tend to go back and forth between Shenzong and Paramartha, and he gives you absolutely no clue that he's doing it. Um, this only happened once in chapter six on, on the Marga. There was a textual problem around verses 45, six, and seven. So he just shifted over and translated Paramartha, which was shortened to the point. And he it doesn't bring in Shenzong at all. Um, in chapter five, I ran across a long, uh, uh, he had shifted to Paramartha, which I caught pretty early on because I'm starting to see it more and more in chapter five. But in that the particular verse, uh, Shenzong had a long digression explaining how these numerical categories worked in that, under that, in, in the Basha. And again, not in the Sanskrit, not in Paramartha. Um, 
but there's no note of that whatsoever in in um, Poussin because he's translating Paramartha. He doesn't even look at, he doesn't regard the deal with Shenzong at all when he shifts to Paramartha. And uh, so that, you know, it's entertaining, uh, but sometimes it's a little frustrating because you, what you're looking at in Shenzong is just not what he's got. Uh, and they, you would love to see how he would have tackled certain phrases and this and that, but you can't because it's just, it, it's not there. Um, so, um, Anyway, that's sort of my my basic take on it. Okay, thank you, Bruce. Uh, Jeffrey? Yeah, just echoing um, what has been said, I feel that the French translation is something of a Frankenstein because it is a interpretation of the Abhidharma Kosha based on multiple sources and interpretations rather than just being a single translation of a single text. And I suppose as a translator of classical Chinese, I feel that it's much more beneficial and scientific if we accurately translate uh, one given established text, such as the Taisho text, um, exactly using uh, the technical vocabulary in translation, just so that we can convey to people who don't read the classical Chinese precisely what the classical Chinese says, even when it deviates from the Sanskrit. And that's an important point too, is that in some cases we have to translate the Chinese faithfully, even when it seems to um, be at odds with the Sanskrit. So the translation that we're doing will hopefully be able to convey to future generations who uh, don't have the time to read classical Chinese, uh, what the what Xuanzang's interpretation of the text was and all of its um, you know, pros and cons as well. Okay, great, Jeffrey. Uh, Cheng? Okay, thank you. I have uh, very little to add. I would just say that, uh, you know, uh, uh, I think all of us agree that uh, Dera Valle Busan uh, amalgamates all the information from various kinds of sources in a very ingenious way. I think we all agree with that, but time has come when uh, we should uh, do a faithful uh, translation of Xuanzang. And also I hope uh, the BDK will fund another project to do a faithful translation of Paramata <laughs> <laughs> no, when time comes. Okay, I think that's something we should do for the next generation. Thank you. Yes, uh, definitely uh, your generation, Jing. Uh, uh, we haven't quite decided what to do, which uh, text to translate in the second series. So uh, I've been saying that it's for the next generation. So definitely uh, we'll keep that in mind. All right, uh, uh, Wei Zheng. Yeah, and as my colleagues here mentioned, Fusen's translation is more a Sanskrit kosher than Xuanzang's Chinese kosher. So um, it is not very helpful, the Fusen's translation. If we want to understand how Xuanzang understood uh, how 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 should I understood the um the uh the the kosher um in particular and how Sanskrit Buddhist scholastic discussions were understood or misunderstood um in the inter intellectual history of Chinese Buddhism in general and what scholastic strat strategies were applied to faithfully render Sanskrit. Uh, Buddhist scholastic dis discussions. So um, in, in our translation, we sometimes purpose purposely ignore the Sanskrit origin. Mm. Okay, great. Thank you all. Um, well, given the critique uh, that we have of Poussin that the, since the only full in, uh, translation of English by uh, Leo Pruden is based on, on the French, then there, so we can see the value of our trans translation, which will be uh, directly from the Chinese. Uh, Bruce, you wanted to uh, comment? You... Yeah, I, I, one little thing. I mean, we have to realize that in some respects, De Valle Poussin was also a, a creature of his time period. And he was fundamentally an Indian Buddhist scholar. And, and he really wanted to, recon to get at what something like the Abhidharma Kosha Basha would have been. And I think, you know, for example, one reason he shifts to Paramartha is sometimes it's it's much more streamlined and Shenzhong seems to go off on various tangents once in a while, um, especially when you compare his and Shenzhong and then the Sanskrit. Sometimes Paramartha is con more concise and really follows the Sanskrit. So I think, you know, he's he's 
moving back and forth. Why he's doing it, I think, really is because he wants to somehow, in his own mind, get to the Indian text. And as an Indian Buddhist scholar, present that to the audience. And I think that's another reason why in the French and the English, there's so many Sanskrit terms. Some of them not even explained anywhere. You just have to I, I have to figure them out in the Chinese um, and then sort of looked at the Sanskrit and, and parsed it and sort of picked it apart grammatically. Um, so he, you know, he he really wanted, I think, to folk, to think he could get at what the Sanskrit really was all about. Now, as as a resource, it's incredible, uh, but as a translation, it's not that faithful. Okay, thank you. And uh, we will have uh, five presentations by our five panelists. So we will now start with the five presentations. We'll have three after uh, three presentations before we take a short break, then two after that, then another short break, and then we have the discussion. So the first uh, 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 presentation will be by uh, Mr. Bibek Sharma, who's presently in Nepal, and uh, he is affiliated with uh, a, with. Uh, Mahidol University in Thailand. His topic is Introduction to the Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya, Author, Sarvas Devada, Abhidharma Literature, and Subsequent Indian Commentarial Tradition. So, Bibek, floor is yours. Okay, um, thank you, Kane. Um, good morning from Thailand. Actually, I'm in Thailand. Oh, right sorry. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Let, let me share my uh, file first. Great. Um, so should I start? Yes. Okay. Um, thank you. Um, uh, from, uh, good morning from uh, Thailand. And uh, thank you, first of all, to all the organizers. Um, uh, I'll be offering the introductory uh, uh, presentation covering several things, uh, you, as you can see. Um, okay, um, so only two complete sets of canonical Abhidharma teachings have survived so far, um, Theravada and Sarvastivada. So we will be talking about the um, Abhidharma of the latter. Uh, I, I will just call it Kosha, Abhidharma Kosha, or Kosha Bhashya, uh, so Kosha. Um, the style and structure of Basubandhu's Abhidharma Kosha is not uh, entirely an innovation of Basubandhu. So that leads us to, to a long Abhidharma commentarial parampara tradition uh, in, this, in this school. So when we talk about this Abhidharma Kosha and commentaries, um, then I will be covering uh, three broad topics. First, uh, the Abhidharma literature among Sarvastivadins, then the Abhidharma Kosh Bhashya and the post M Kosha commentarial works. And I will give you one example from Yashobitra's Kutartha Vyakya to show how commentaries works uh, and then uh, work and then uh, how it is important to look at these old commentaries to uh, unpack these root texts. So um, when we talk about the uh, um, uh, Sarvastivata scholasticism, um, well, this school, we don't know the definite point of the origin of Sarvastivata school, but it already existed at the time of King Ashoka that we know. And then uh, um, seven treatises uh, are the basis of the classical Sarvastivadin scholasticism. Uh, the Jnana Prasthana is the most important one collected by Katya Anipata. It has own history I have written in my paper. Uh, and then Kashmiri by Vasikans wrote a huge commentary called Mahavivasha uh, that establishes the Vaivasikan orthodoxy. And that is the point of departure of its scholasticism. Um, and then there appeared a number of other treatises in a following order, more or less, uh, sometimes challenging by Vasikan orthodoxy, inspired by Bosumitra's Prakaranapada. So these are the, um, uh, the subsequent, you can say, treatises written by various authors, Kosakas, Amrita Rasa Sastra, then Thermasris, 
uh, Avidharma Sara, Avidharma Rida, you can see these are all reconstructed because uh, these are extant in Chinese. Upashantas, Avidharma Ridaya, uh, and then comes uh, the Dharma Tratas, uh, Avidharma Ridaya, Vyakya. The importance of this one is particularly uh, emphasized because this manual follows Upashanta's commentary and is Basubandhu's direct reference. Uh, well, of course, he draws from Mahavivasha and so on and so forth, but a lot from this one. And then comes Abhidharma Kosha and Bhashya. So following this style of Dharma Dratta, Basubandhu composed Abhidharma Kosha, Karika and his uh, own auto-commentary. Uh, mostly from the point of view of Vaivasika orthodoxy. Uh, and then its auto commentary called Bhasya, he criticizes several Vaivasikan foundational teachings, often taking Sautrantic position. Um, of course, there, there was an opponent, uh, Sangha Bhadra did not like Bhashivandu's presentation, so he wrote two uh, texts. Um, well, uh, Avidharma Nyaya Nishara is the, the, uh, the, the main. And Sangabhata defends uh, Bhaivasikan orthodoxy in, in this text and attacks Basubandhu several of the Bhaivasikan understanding. Uh, so more or less, I mean, because I have to cover a, a lot of topics, so I, I go fast. Um, now we come to Kosha and his Bhashya. So as I said, the style and the structure along with the sequence of chapters are not entirely an innovation of Basubandhu. Um, so inferred from the, when we talk about the Bhashabandhu as uh, author uh, of Kosha, inferred from the existing Chinese, Tibetan, Sanskrit, we, he probably lived in nor northwestern part of India, sometimes during the fifth century, uh, more or less. There are lots of literature on this. Uh, it, of course, it was extremely popular text. Uh, a lot of commentaries were written in India, Tibet, and China. Um, uh, to give you an example of the extent of its popularity, uh, Tibetan translators decided to translate the Avidharma Kosha Bhashya only to the exception of Prakim disaster. So they thought that it will subsume all the others as well as the, uh, the gist of uh, uh, the Savaka Sutras also. Uh, when we talk about the structure of Abhidharma Kosh Bhashya, okay, uh, more or less it is um, divided into nine chapters called Kosa Istana. We can translate it as, as uh, treasury location or something like that. And then um, neither Basubandhu or um, other commentators, so far as I know, uh, they uh, give you the overall structure of Abhidharma Kosh Bhashya. However, uh, Basubandhu offers to Uddesha a brief expositional topic in the first chapter. So uh, he divides uh, the entire, well, as far as we understand, the entire uh, Abhidharma Kosu Bhashya into Sastrava, the dharmas with Sastrava, with outflows, and dharmas without outflows, Anastra, right? So um, the entire Abhidharma Kosha ba is based on these two categories. How do we know this? We know from uh, different sources and commentaries, mainly here, a Chinese native commentator, Fu Kuang, offers two vital information about the structure and the, uh, let's say, um, the subject matter of this uh, text. So he says that uh, Kosha focuses mainly on no self, among the three seals, so others being impermanence and uh, suffering, right? So three seals of the dharmas. Uh, this is explained, well, Basubandhu explains uh, about no self in the 20th verse of the first chapter of AKB Edge uh, a little bit there, and, uh, um, and, it, and it's Bahashya. Uh, and also the last chapter is about more or less about the, uh, well, it's a uh, attack towards Udgalvadins, but it's mostly about the no self. Um, and the second most in, uh, important information Fu Kuang uh, gives us is that chapters are in cause and effect sequence. So, how does it work? The first two chapters 
um, expound the ultimately real dharma, the 75 ultimately real dharmas of uh, uh, the Sarvastivadins without flows and without outflows. And then uh, the third, fourth, and fifth chapter, Loka, Nirdesha, Karma, and Anushaya, it is in the sequence of fruit, cause, and conditions. These are uh, uh, without flows dharmas, sastava dharmas. Then the sixth, seventh, and eighth, Margaputkala, Gyan, and Samapati, the sequence of uh, the fruit, the cause, and conditions once again. These are the without flows dharmas, more or less, right? This is the structure <coughs> of Abhidharma Kosh Pasi. Now, when we talk about the Indian commentaries, um, there are seven, uh, the most important and the most comprehensive, as far as I can see, is the Yashomitra's Yashputartha Abhidharma Kosh Vyakya, preserved, only preserved, uh, in, I mean, preserved uh, in Sanskrit, the only text. Then um, uh, Vinita Bhadra's text, uh, then comes Purnavardhana's Lakshana Anusari, major and minor, and then Samatha Deva's Kupaika, and then Dignaga's Marma Pradipa, and then Stirimati's Tattvartha. And <clears throat> its uh, Sanskrit text has been recently discovered as far as I understand. Um, now, when we talk about the commentarial dexterity, because we are mostly concerned with how to translate this ancient, ancient text in, in, in the modern times, um, we know very little uh, um, uh, uh, I would like to present something from the Yeshua Mitra's uh, Vyakya and Yeshua Mitra himself. We know very little about the author of Spudartha Nama Avidharma Kosha Vyakya. I will just call it Vyakya, right? The author of Yeshua Mitra. Um, he probably lived around 7th century because some of the texts, the Vyakarana texts, he cites there, such as Kasika Vritti and so forth, they are dated around 7th century. So we know for sure that he was around that time, but we don't know much about him. Um, <clears throat> it is the most exhaustive, comprehensive commentary on the root text in terms of linguistic and doctrinal analysis. Um, okay, uh, now when we talk about uh, his the commentarial um, dexterity and his uh, ability, uh, two main features of his authorship we can see. Uh, number one, it is replete with grammatical and linguistic analysis, mostly from the Panini system, but also from Patanjali's Mahavashya, the Chandavritti and Kashika Vritti. So far, as I have seen uh, in, in the first chapter, <clears throat> And then there are valuable information, valuable information on Buddhist philosophy and the positions taken by different Buddhist masters for school. So it is a, a mine, it's a really a treasure. Uh, then um, uh, I would offer two examples from the first chapter of Dhatu Nirdesha, how he unpacks uh, um, Bandhu's intention from the first uh, verse uh, of Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya. So, um, uh, uh, so when while highlighting, <clears throat> I will be uh, uh, focusing on two things. Um, he uses highly sophisticated convention of employing Sanskrit drama while exposing a Sanskrit text or a particular tradition, and then the commentarial dexterity of a commentator. I'll be focusing on these two. So first of all, uh, while commenting on the first uh, verse uh, of uh, Abhidharma Kosabhasi, which is a praise to the Buddha, it is not written there, but we understand the word Buddha there. Uh, so um, he offers the definition of Buddha according to the Karaka system. Now, I will offer very rudimentary information about Karaka. So Karaka is a spe specific feature of Sanskrit drama and is vital in terms of understanding syntactic as well as semantic functions in a sentence. Um, so in other words, it's primarily concerned with the question of agency, who is doing what and where the action is being performed and its completion. So this is a very, very brief. So how do we understand the word Buddha according to this uh, Karaka system? So the first example he offers is uh, we understand the word Buddha 
um, you know, as a kata denoting an agent. So, um, uh, so what does it mean? So normally, well, in English, let me say uh, kata we use to uh, to make a past participle. Let's say right. And here, in the in, in the sense of agent works, uh, I have given one example. Gato deva datto grama. So in English, we can translate more or less like deva datta went to a village. Let's say so uh, as an agent. He will present the this uh, the definition of Buddha. So he says the word Buddha is an application of Buddha in the sense of agent. So Buddha is in the sense of the blossoming of the mind. The meaning is the same as blossomed, just like in the expression the lotus has blossomed. Alternatively, Buddha is in the sense of having removed the twofold slip of ignorance. The sense is awakened. It is like the expression. An awakened person. So here we can see he uses grammar, the the uh, Sanskrit grammar, to unpack uh, something, the inserted meaning in the first verse, uh, and there is a philosophical implication too. So so um, um, the vyakarana and the philosophical things uh, of a text. Kind of developed symbiotically in this in this kind of commentary of literature. Um, and then the second example he uh, offers is from the point of view of karma karta. So how does it function, and what is karma karta? So karma karta is like let's say in a very simple word, karma is is the object in English grammar. Let's say it's an object. So, but when we talk about the karma kartari, it is an object, but at the same time an agent, an agent which is at the same time the object of an action. Let's say. So, for example, pachate odana swayam eva. But when we translate this into English, it is it sounds something something like the rice uh, cooked itself or something. But it 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 really doesn't work. Uh, in terms of English, but in in Sanskrit we can do that for various reasons. So then uh, here is how he understands the word Buddha according to this rule, the karma karta. Right, the Buddha means he becomes awakened by himself. Now, uh, do we have any philosophical uh, indication? Yes, in several suttas, in several instances, the Buddha said that I do not have any teacher. I got enlightened by myself because he had been practicing for a long time, and then he uh, he realized the bodhi, um, uh, remembering all the teachings he, he learned during during the time of uh, uh, the previous training as a bodhisattva. So he says that in many places. That's how Buddhists understand uh, Buddha's enlightenment. So here he offers. All of a sudden, he combines these two things: the the word Buddha uh, with the, the grammar. At the same time, the philosophical implication. Okay. Now uh, I uh, um, uh, I will offer a brief explanation by Katyayana. So Katyayana notes about the about the karma kartari. So Katyayana notes the reason why A three one eight seven. This is the Panini uh, F uh, Sutra that. Yashomitra uses to justify the word Buddha in terms of this explanation, and uh, uh, how this um, A three one eighty seven is formulated. A participant such as rice, of which was a karman, an object, and is now spoken of as an agent, karma karta, has the property of being an agent because one wishes to speak of its independence. So I will not <laughs> go into details, but. Okay, this is how it works, and uh, he, uh, this is uh, classically uh, understood in this way. So, lost in translation, all these things. When we look at uh, the, let's say, for example, uh, when we understand the word Buddha uh, in in Chinese as Huo, uh, uh, then we lose all these grammatical, syntactic, philosophical aspects. How the Indian uh, authors used to 
close them, right? I'm not saying that things are not translatable in, 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 in Chinese, but I'm just trying to give an example of how commentarial works in the Indian context works and how the, uh, the uh, Sanskrit words and the technical vocabularies could be loaded uh, and how they, the commentators skillfully uh, uh, brought out the meaning uh, uh, using various different tools, right? Okay. Now I think I'll go to the uh, my conclusion. Mm. <clears throat> okay. Now my conclusion is the uh, Abhidharma Kosha Bhashya is almost the culminating point of Sarvasti Bada Abhidharma. As I explained, uh, it replaced almost all the other texts uh, in many places. Um, the art of writing a commentary in the Indian Sastic literature, that means commentary um, literature, is a complex skill. And as we have noticed in the case of Yashomita's closeness, well, the examples I gave were rudimentary, but when we really go into uh, other texts and other parts of the same text, he offers very elaborate uh, uh, um, explanation glosses uh, and using um, uh, complex grammatical and philosophical things. Mm, uh, such commentarial works uh, are indispensable while unpacking ancient Indian root text. Otherwise, we don't understand because in the first verse, uh, um, Vashubandhu does not use the word the Buddha. He, uh, but we understand and the implication uh, of those uh, compounds and various things, we understand it uh, through the commentary literature. So thank you. I'm a little bit, uh, uh, I took a little bit more time, but thank you very much. Uh, uh, yes, now okay. I am here. Thank you, uh, Bibek, for your presentation. Okay, uh, next we have uh, uh, Dr. Bruce Williams, uh, uh, affiliated with the, uh, the East Asian Library at the University of uh, California at Berkeley. And he will be uh, discussing on the topic of the, the puzzle of the Sarvastivada Abhidharma corpus among Xuanzang's translations. So Bruce. Uh, good afternoon or evening, everyone. When I started translating my chapters, I worked primarily to understand their language and uh, narrative style. And all of us were enjoined to use the Digital Dictionary of Buddhism, or DDB. I soon noticed two things. Um, first, because of the uniform translation terminology, the references to other Savastavada Abhidharma works were easily traced in the extensive Savastavada Abhidharma corpus translated by Shenzong. And second, a significant number of terms listed in DDB that we were dealing, I was dealing with, uh, were referred to as Yogacara, frequently with a reference to the relevant section of the Yogacara Bhumi. Yet I was seeing them in the earlier Abhidharma Kosha, often with detailed explanations. Um, my curiosity was piqued. Now, how simple is this situation? Um, to begin with, what is a solidly non-Mahayana corpus of Sarvastivada Abhidharma texts? doing among Xuanzang's extensive list of translations, the only non-Mahayana texts that he translated and second only to the Prajnaparamita corpus uh, in the number of fascicles translated. Um, this is the list of his 13 Abhidharma uh, translations. They're arranged chronologically by translation. They include the Jnana Prasthana and five of its ancillary texts mentioned by, by Bibek. Um, also, it's commentary, the Mahavibhasha, and the works of Sangabhadra and Vasubandhu. Since this course corpus was translated as a group by teams of translators under Shenzong's direction, it employs a standardized vocabulary. <clears throat> but this vocabulary was first employed in their translation of a Sangha Sabhidhamma Samuchaya and its Bhasha or commentary, and later from 646 to 648 in the Yogacara Bhumi. Now, given their consistent use of lists, terminology, and categories, these texts were translated in full recognition of their indebtedness to North Indian Abhidharma and its terminology. 
the whole Abhidhamma course uh, was translated later between 649 and 663 after this terminology was developed. Now the focus of Xuanzang's Abhidharma corpus was <clears throat> the Abhidharma Kosha Bhasha. It was virtually the only text in this corpus for which Xuanzang's disciples wrote commentaries. It also uh, probably didn't hurt that it was written by Vasubandhu. Now, Vasubandhu's Abhidharma Kosha Bhasha faces two directions. It is a concise summary of the mature Savastavada position on the one hand. On the other, its Autrantika criticisms put it on a trajectory to some of the mature Yogacara positions of Asanga's Yogacara Bhumi. Its importance is also underscored by having Sangabhadra's works translated along with it. Sangabhadra's responses are providing, as it were, uh, counterpoints to these Sautrantika critiques and, detailed is, and is also a detailed reassertion of the Sarvastavada position, all demonstrate the strengths and weaknesses of both positions and perhaps by extension of the Yogacara as well. Now, of course, there are sectarian issues in these debates, yet preoccupation with sectarian issues and differences may blind us to the fact that Abhidharma was also a larger platform for, of debate among Indian Buddhists. In fact, I believe this is the main reason for translating the Savastavada corpus into Chinese. Most other schools, including the Yogacara, had their own Abhidharma literature. Authorities, texts, and perspectives used by those involved in these debates could differ. But as a platform, it provided much shared terminology and methodology, and it allowed different perspectives to be clearly defined and debated. But why translate virtually the whole Sarvastivada Abhidharma corpus? That was an enormous expenditure of resources. Even the emperor himself asked Shenzong to discontinue his translation of the Mahavyabhi Basha so he could focus his energies on more important uh, texts, a request that he later dropped. But there was an important issue at stake. I believe Shenzong wanted to provide the full background and framework of the Abhidharmic debates. Such works as the Yogacara Bhumi and the Abhidharma Sambhuchiya play off of these, but they do not provide them. With this framework, without this framework, we might argue that understanding Yogacara works as these is incomplete. <clears throat> now, as an example, let's take a brief look at certain aspects of the path of seeing or Darshana Marga as seen in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhasha, Sankabhadra's response in Nyaya Nasara, and in the Yogacara. This is not a simple issue, so here we will only focus on one aspect of it, the path of seeing occurring all at once, versus happening gradually over a series of successive moments. Vasubandhu's commentary to verse 27a through c in chapter 6 of the Abhidharma Kosha Bhasha raises the question whether the clear realization of Abhisamaya in the path of seeing happens all at once in a single moment or in a succession of 16 moments. There the Savastavadan interlocutor mentions that another school claims that this clear re realization happens all at once. Vasubandhu in the Abhidharma Kosha Bhasha discussion poses a series of questions, but on the whole is rather brief. He does not appear to argue very strenuously for the all at once position. Sangabhadra's response in his Nayanasara is on the other hand, a detailed response to these questions and raises issues and arguments not mentioned in the Abhidharma Kosha. Creating a pseudo Vasubandhu, he first presents Vasubandhu's scriptural arguments and then the analogies he uses in his reasoned arguments. Uh, Sangabhadra then responds to each of these in turn, arguing that the path of seeing takes place sequentially and not all at once, a position that he states Vasubandhu himself supports. Not unexpectedly, the Yogacara position is more complex. <clears throat> different models come from different sources and traditions with little attempt to reconcile them. Each model has its own dynamic. Unfortunately, no one Yogacara source presents all of the options in characterizing the path of seeing. We insist, we, <clears throat> pardon me, we see instead almost a progression from the Abhidharma Samuchya and its commentary to the Yogacara Bhumi, and finally to the Chengwe Shirlun, often referred to by its reconstructed Sanskrit title, the Vignepti Matrata Siddhi. First, the Abhidharma Samuchya and its commentary. Lambert Schmidhausen has briefly discussed the four characterizations of the path of seeing in the Abhidharma Samuchya. The first three are summaries of this path. The fourth lays it out in a more detailed fashion. 
Put somewhat differently, the first three discuss what it is or means. The fourth discusses how it works. As Schmidthausen points out, each characterization comes in a modified form from a different source, either Mahayana or non-Mahayana. <clears throat> Although the Abhidharma Samuchaya lists them, it makes no effort to reconcile their differences. The four characterizations, following Sundu An, who either quotes or summarizes Schmidhausen, are given on the screen. The commentary to the Abhidharma Samuchaya regards the first three characterizations as different aspects of the path of seeing. The fourth characterization has the same structural outline as the Savasadavada path of seeing in 16 moments. In the fourth characterization, each of the four noble truths is cognized in four moments each. One moment of the receptivity to the knowledge of the Dharma, or Dharma Jnanak Shanti, which cognizes each truth as object, or the grasp, and eliminates the defilements for that truth followed by one moment of the knowledge of the Dharma or Dharma Jnana that confirms this elimination of these defilements. These are then followed by one moment of the receptivity to the proximate knowledge and by a Jnana, Jnana Shanti, which cognizes the cognizer or the grasper of the first two moments, followed by one moment of proximate knowledge or and by a Jnana that confirms this. Um, for the Savastavadin, the first two moments for each truth cognize that truth in the realm of desire, while the next two moments cognize that truth for the realms of form and the formless realm simultaneously. Cognizing the realms is totally absent from the Yogacara formulation of the path of seeing in 16 moments. To align the fourth option with the first three, and especially the first one, in which there is the, as you can see, the non-apprehension of the distinction between the grasper and the grasp, the commentary interprets the first moment or aspect, akara, of each truth in the fourth option to, read not to, the, to refer not to the truth itself in the, as uh, Schmidhausen put, puts it, the concrete collective sense of all individual factors as characterized by that truth, end of quote, but to the uniform true nature or ta 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 of that truth and the second moment to refer to the transformation of the basis uh, or in Ashraya Paravirti. Uh, understood as that same true nature, but freed of defilements. In this way, the summary makes the fourth opinion largely doctrinally consistent with the first three options. Now, how do these four characterizations line up with the issue of realization all at once or sequentially? <clears throat> the Abhidhamma Samuchi and its commentary are silent on this issue, this issue for the first three, although the first two could be accomplished in a single moment, and the third in perhaps three moments, as we shall see below. Again, the first three focus on what the path of seeing is or accomplishes. How long it might take is not at issue. The fourth clearly takes 16 moments. The Yoga Charabhumi presents us with a different landscape. The path of seeing in 16 moments does not appear there. In fact, among the basic Yogacara texts in the Taisho, it appears only in the Abhidharma Samutya, its commentary, and briefly in the Chongwe Shirlo nor have I yet been able to locate any mention of the first two options in the Yogacara Bhumi. It does, however, present us with three further options. First, a path of seeing in three chitta or thought moments, a reworking of the third characterization from the Abhidharma Samuchaya. Second, a path of seeing pertaining to tranquility and insight, or shamatha vipassana, in nine chitta moments. And three, the first clear description of the path of seeing in one Chitta moment. While well, the first two make use of the concepts of the knowledge of Dharma and the proximate knowledge, their pairing with receptivity does not occur. It is noteworthy that the path of seeing in a single moment is not presented here as an exclusionary alternative to the sequential path, but rather as its correlate. They are two aspects of the same realization. Just the path of seeing in three chitta moments. I'm following on translations with adjustments and apologies. Um, there are three summaries here for the path of seeing. <clears throat> In the first summary, BA1, oops, sorry, BA1, the three moments are two moments of knowledge of the Dharma and one moment of proximate knowledge. The first two remove the commentarial notions of sentient beings and of dharmas. The third removes all remaining notions of sentient beings and dharmas simultaneously. 
The first two remove weak level and middling level deb deb debilitating defilements, respectively. The third removes all debilitating defilements. As noted above, neither of these terms are paired with receptivity or kshanti, which in the Sarvastivada model of the path of seeing in 16 moments does the work of removing the defilements. Here that work is done by the knowledges themselves. Gone also are any references to the Four Noble Truths, and again, the three realms do not figure into this threefold formulation. There are, however, two holdovers from the Savastavada model, the terminology, and while in the Savastavada model, proximate knowledge simultaneously cognizes the two upper two realms. Here it simultaneously cognizes the previous two knowledges of the Dharma. But in the second summary, BA2, the function of the receptivities may, however, be reintroduced through the back door. Although there are three moments each of shamatha and vipassana, these occur simultaneously. Ostensibly, the three moments of vipassana correspond to the three moments of knowledge outlined in the first summary. What do the three moments of shamatha correspond to? Judging by some of the parallel Yogacara formulations of the path of seeing, these would seem to correspond to three moments of receptivity. As the discussion of uh, the path of seeing in nine moments makes clear below, both shamatha and vipassana may eliminate defilements. The third summary, BA3, gives us the vocabulary to describe the first two summaries. The last section, BB, my translation, not ons, shows that this sequence of three moments moves from the non-established truth of suffering, etc., through to the established truth of suffering, etc. But differently, it moves from the second clear realization of a group of six, the culmination of the Shravaka path of seeing, through to the culmination of this, this fourth clear realization, the Mahayana path of seeing. How does the path of seeing in nine chitta moments proceed? Uh, Sundu An translates the mass passage on the path of seeing in nine chitta moments as follows again with adjustments and apologies. Since the eight moments of the knowledge of the Dharma and the proximate knowledge are paired throughout with a single moment of shamatha, it is probably safe to bet that these eight moments of knowledge are moments of vipassana. As a passage shortly following this treatment of the path of seeing in nine moments makes clear, both shamatha and vipassana eliminate defilements. Vipassana eliminates those defilements associated with the sense organs, while shamatha eliminates those associated with the mind and the mental factors. <clears throat> Presumably the same dynamic is at play in the path of seeing in three moments we discussed earlier. This enables the path of seeing to eliminate not only the normal defilements or kleshas, but also the obstacles to knowledge, vignaya varana. Both functions are involved in the Mahayana path of seeing, but not in a non-Mahayana path of seeing, such as that of the Savastavada. Now, one issue with this description uh, in the path of seeing is its treatment of shamatha. The passage appears to say that there is one chitta moment of shamatha, which lasts for the duration of eight chitta moments of vipassana, and the combined this path of seeing thus has nine chitta moments. This treatment of shamatha is idiosyncratic, to say the least. The duration of a chitta moment should be the same for all conditioned karma dharmas, including shamatha and vipassana. Now, this suggests to me that this path of seeing may well have been an adaptation of the path of seeing in 16 moments. Alternatively, as in the path of seeing in three moments, the shamatha moments and the vipassana moments might each be combined into a single moment, giving us a total of eight chitta moments for this path. Each of these eight moments would then involve the dual elimination of both the defilements as well as the obstacles to knowledge. We would thus get 16 moments, or eight, but not nine. Unfortunately, the passage passes over these uh, issues without comment. Immediately following the passage just translated, there is a description of the path in seeing in one chitta or thought moment. As is often the case when dealing with occurrences of a, in a single moment, there are a few details. This passage does say that this single moment of knowledge is associated with a single moment of shamatha. Since together we still only have one single moment, this is reminiscent of the pairing in the path of seeing in three moments. An unpacks this by arguing that the see, paths of seeing in these two passage, one in nine moments and one in a single moment, contrast the path of seeing under the auspices of conventional truth 
with the path of seeing viewed as ultimate truth. Now, most of the paths of seeing we presented are summarized in the commentary to verse 28 of the Chung Wei Shilun. On outlines its presentation, which I give to you in the screen of your this for your perusal. According to An, the distinction between A and B, or true Darshanamarga, or Darshanamarga with aspects, appears to be an innovation of the Chung Wei Shilun. He does not know of its appearance in any earlier Argyogachara text. The distinctions under B are all attested in earlier Yogacara texts, with one exception. B, B, 2, following a distinction of the three spheres, as we have noted throughout, does not appear in any of the Yogacara texts that we have dealt with. As we also noted earlier, the path of seeing in three moments in B, A, starts with two moments that deal with non-established truth, but ends by bringing the path of seeing to its final culmination in the third moment with the established truth. We see three things in the Yogacara presentation of the path of seeing in terms of all at once or gradually and sequentially. First, the paths of seeing presented come from a variety of sources, non-Mahayana and Mahayana. But as a Mahayana path of seeing, they must eliminate both the defilements and the obstacles to knowledge. To this end, both knowledge expressed directly or as Vipassana and Shamatha, a likely token for receptivity or Kshanti, are involved in eliminating articles, obstacles, not just receptivity as in the uh, Sarvastavadin. Second, Yogacara models share the terminology and aspects of the structure of the Sarvastavada path of seeing, but their operations have been adjusted significantly. Third, the path of seeing in a single moment in both the Yogacara Bhumi and the Chung Wei Shilun is contrasted with the sequential paths of seeing, but it is a contrast in relationship. They are two aspects of the same realization. This may involve a model in which, as ultimate truth, it plays its out, itself out through the conventional truth, as An suggests with the Yogacara Bhumi, or as in the Chung Wei Shilun, it is a single realization that must play itself out in conventional reality to demonstrate its impact. Now, I give here an overall summary of what I've just been talking about. I'll finish up with one paragraph. In all of the models outlined above, there is a preference for the path of seeing to be sequential, either by itself or as a necessary reflex of the path of seeing in a single moment. There is little effort to explain their differences other than to juxtapose them or organize them in overarching categories. Your Yogacara tried to resolve the all at once versus gradual debate <clears throat> by positing them as two aspects of the same realization. To my mind, this needs further elucidation. The more practical issue here for the Yogacara is how to reconcile the various sequential paths. How are these to be resolved? Are they the same? If so, how? If they're not the same, which is correct and why? From here, the story moves to the commentaries. That is where future research will go, but those are stories for another day. Okay, thank you, Bruce, for your okay. presentation. Uh, for okay. the uh, those of you in the audience, please note that all of our, of our uh, PowerPoint presentations will be made available to you. So please uh, 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 ear, have your ears open, eyes open for uh, from the uh, sponsors about the how they will be made available to you. Okay, the final presentation in this uh, segment before the break uh, will be by uh, Jeff, uh, Dr. Jeffrey Kotick. Yes. Uh, and and his, uh, his topic is Abhidharma Kosha as a reflection of earlier Agama and Nikaya Buddhism. He is uh, uh, currently uh, situated in Italy at the University of Bologna. So Jeffrey, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, good evening, good afternoon to everybody globally. So today I want to talk about the Buddhist world. So how did Buddhists in antiquity view the physical world? And how does this relate to Abhidharma? So uh, as, we, as we might already know, Buddhists didn't have a model of the solar system that we're familiar with today but rather it was comprised of Mount Sumeru and the four continents. And this is the foundational worldview of Buddhists in ancient India. And this worldview was also carried over to other Buddhist cultures, such as China, Tibet, Japan, etc. And Abhidharma, of course, inherited the cosmology of 
early Buddhism. And it was of particular interest also to the authors in the Abhidharma tradition, such as Vasubandhu, the author of the Abhidharma Kosha. So why study cosmology? Well, I think it's important to study cosmology because this was the um, actual outlook of Buddhists and how they saw the world. In addition to their views on the theory of mind or the theory of um, matter, so we can also look at this from, you know, a view of evaluating uh, whether they built upon the physical worldview scientifically or not. Now, to summarize, there is this idea of Mount Sumeru, also called Mount Meru, they're synonymous, at the center of a disc-shaped world. And so Mount Meru is surrounded by concentric rings of mountains and the four continents. And we live on the southern continent of Jambudvipa. You can see here a cosmological mandala with Mount Meru dating to the 14th century in China. And it gives you a nice view of how uh, Buddhists at the time uh, in China would have saw the world, the physical world in this way. Uh, Wikimedia Commons has this very convenient uh, 3D image and it shows you uh, not just the flat disc at the top, but also the underlying structure of the world, which is actually a sort of uh, conical shape you can see. And you can also see the Mount Sumeru is an hourglass shape. So it's flat on the top and then um, it's bulky at the bottom and thin in the middle. And the Pali Canon and the early Buddhist literature uh, describe this world. And there's often uh, events that occur on Mount Meru. So for example, Indra lives on top of Mount Meru. And there was a long time ago where the Asuras, the fallen gods also lived up there as well. But Indra in a jealous fit cast them all off. And so now they live at the bottom. And as the Pali Canon says, sometimes they crawl up the mountain like ants going up a tree and Indra has to smite them back down. And also in some cases too, you have people uh, migrating uh, between the different continents, but generally humans are confined to Jambudvipa because we live on the Southern continent. And you can see that it's triangular shaped and modern scholars would suggest that this is reflective actually of uh, India, the geography of India. And it was projected onto this sort of uh, worldscape. And you can see that there's two other smaller continents or islands flanking either side. Of course, uh, we would suspect that uh, this is a reflection of Sri Lanka and because they had an emphasis on creating a parallel um, sort of uh, a model that you ended up having a second island on the left flanking uh, Jambudvipa. Now this worldview of course um, also includes the stars and the moon and the sun. So the sun and the moon revolve around Mount Sumeru at about halfway the altitude of the mountain. This is described also in the Agamas, the early Buddhist literature, and also in Abhidharma. But interestingly, there's no mention of the other planets in early Buddhist literature. Um, and that's an interesting point because there's contemporary voices in antiquity, such as Plato, um, who existed around the same time as the Buddha and the early Buddhists, who also have uh, knowledge of the planets, but you don't see that in early Buddhist literature. Uh, you just see the sun and the moon. And I want to emphasize that this cosmology was understood as physically real, um, and the setting and the rising of the sun and the moon were explained based on a flat earth model. Mm -hmm. So if you imagine you're standing on Jambudvipa, the southern continent, on this disc-shaped world, so as you see the sun rising and setting, what you're actually seeing according to this worldview is the sun and the moon circuiting um, around the disc world. So you see it rising in the east and setting in the west. And so on the south continent, when it's noon, it's the middle of the night on the northern continent. And this is how um, the literature paints this cosmology. And the explanation of this cosmology is uh, attributed to the Buddha himself. So this is canonical knowledge. So Indra lives atop Mount Sumeru, Brahma lives in heaven above it, and the Asuras live below the mountain, and the hells are um, below it. So in this sort of world too, we also have the position of the heavens. So Brahma doesn't live on the mountain, but he lives above it in one of the heavens. And the hell realms are also positioned underneath Mount Meru. So this is the sort of worldview that we see in the <laughs> early Buddhist literature. So the myth of a mountain dwelling of the gods also stretches back to an Indo-European heritage. Um, as you might be familiar, Indo-European is a language family. Languages such as the Germanic languages of German, 
and English, as well as the Romance languages of Latin and French, but also Hindi and Sanskrit and Persian, all go back to an ancestral language of, of Persian, or um, of Indo-European rather. So uh, this should also bring to mind Mount Asgard um, in the Nordic tradition and Mount Olympus in the Greek tradition. So we can also uh, infer that the Buddhists had inherited this sort of cosmology also from an earlier heritage. So if the Buddha had taught this cosmology, as it seems he did, then uh, this was also inherited from a much earlier ancient tradition as well. So the Durga Agama, so this is the long discourse collection of, of sermons of the Buddha. He explains the physical dimensions um, of the world. For example, he says that this great earth has a depth of uh, 168,000 yojanas. Its bounds are limitless. The earth stops at water. So again, this is a physical dimension that's given. A yojana is, the definition of a yojana depends on uh, the time period. Generally, it's said to be the uh, the distance that you can hear somebody shouting very loudly. So we would maybe guess that's about half a mile. And the Buddha also says that the king of mountains, Sumeru, reaches into the waters for 84,000 yojanas, and it protrudes out of the sea, reaching a height of 84,000 yojanas. So again, we're seeing a real um, detailed description of the physical world, like actual physical dimensions that could hypothetically be modeled, and you could make calculations based on it. And it seems that probably um, some scholars did just that. And the sun and the moon are described as floating palaces orbiting um, around uh, Mount Meru rather than being individual deities. So in this case, it's different from the Vedic tradition or the Greek tradition, because, for example, we would think of Helios in the Greek tradition or Surya in the Vedic tradition as a sing single god. But in this Buddhist model that's described in the Agamas, what you see is a um, floating palace. So you have, for example, um, it's said that the central hall in which the solar deity stays is, const is constructed of pure gold. It is 16 yojanas in height. The hall has four gates surrounded by railings. So it's an actual divine palace on top of a disc that's circuiting around Mount Meru and the four continents. It's not a solar system. And it's also not a single individual deity, but rather it's a palace inhabited by many deities. And there is a chief solar god who sits upon the throne, but it's not, it's like a society or a community of solar gods rather than being a single god. And so this is something that we also have to keep in mind because the Vedic tradition had the idea of Surya as a single god. And also the luminosity of the sun is also attributed to the presence of a divinity. So the light of the golden hall illuminates the solar palace. And this is this light of the solar palace illuminates the world below in the four directions. So there's an actual, um, you know, a, a physical explanation for luminosity that's given uh, in this literature as well. And it's not combustion and it's not necessarily fire either, but rather it's the God who inhabits that. And I should emphasize too, as the literature suggests, you know, humans can, and any being can be reborn as, as the solar God, as Surya, and they have a lifespan of about 500 years. And then it just, uh, the successor takes over. So we can be reborn also as the sun God as well. And then there's the Abhidharma Kosha. So Vasubandhu was actually very much interested in physical cosmology because he has a chapter titled The World. It's chapter three in the Abhidharma Kosha. And this chapter, I would argue, presents the typical Buddhist worldview based upon the model of Mount Sumeru and the four continents. But Vasubandhu also um, cites various other authors and schools in describing or debating, rather, some features of this uh, universe. So it was something that was also discussed in Buddhist schools themselves, the composition of the cosmos. So it was clearly an important part of Buddhist learning. And it's something I think in modern times, maybe we overlook because it doesn't seem necessarily relevant to our um, primary concerns, which could be, for example, Buddhist theory of mind or karma. So also the Abhidharma Kosha does not mention uh, the other planets apart from the sun and the moon. Um, it would seem that Vasu, Vasubandhu apparently um, had no knowledge of the planets. In some ways, that's uh, kind of surprising because the Indian uh, history, the Indian tradition of astronomy, Jyotish, um, very clearly describes uh, the motion of the planets. Um, so we can surmise possibly that the systematic knowledge of the planets hadn't filtered into uh, the religious tradition of Buddhism in India. 
and it might have been restricted more to uh, the tradition of the professional astronomers in India, because you don't see the mention of the five planets, which is interesting. And so Vasubandhu attempts to explain the orbit of the sun and the moon based upon a type of mechanistic theory. Um, this is something that he seems to be um, developing um, using his own uh, base of knowledge that's not necessarily described as clearly in the Agamas and the Nikayas. So this is which the bodies um, move around Mount Meru propelled by a wind, um, Vayu, and this is brought about by the collective karma of beings. And this is the support lifting the sun, moon and stars. So um, by virtue of just you know viewing the world and you could see that there's a lot of motion caused by the wind there was an assumption that there must be a very strong current of wind that's propelling uh, the sun and the moon so mount maru and the four continents are stationary and the cosmic bodies above are propelled by wind they didn't have a they didn't have a model of gravity but what's interesting is there's this idea of collective karma so the physical world is brought about due to the collective karma of all beings the gods, the humans, asuras, animals. Now it's Vasubandhu in the Abhidharma Kosha who explicitly says this, but it's again based on the ideas that he would have found in the Agamas, the early Buddhist literature. And although there is a clear ordering and predictable structure to the world, it's not organized according to some plan or divine willpower because there's no creator in the Buddhist worldview. And Vasubandhu and Buddhist authors had to avoid this problem. And I think that's interesting also because the kind of world that is described in the Abhidharma Kosha is very orderly and systematic, but there can't be a creator God um, behind it. There can't be any sort of divine will organizing it, some sort of system of intelligent design. It has to be from the collective karma of, of, of beings. But the actual way that collective karma would um, systematically organize the universe in this way, in a very repetitive way, is unclear. And I say repetitive because um, as Vasubandhu describes, once the world is brought to an end through a great conflagration, it will reemerge in the future, in, in, in the future, more or less in the same way. And there's other universes as well in the other directions that also have a central pillar of a mountain surrounded by continents. So they saw this as replicating itself. Um, um, and he goes on to say that the winds are in space and arise contingent upon the collective karma of beings. So again, there's this emphasis on uh, the winds propelling everything. And also the physical composition of the sun and the moon are also described. And these concepts are also derived from the Agamas. So according to Vasubandhu, the bottom surface of the solar disk is comprised of crystal stone. Uh, the whole is fire pearl and this stone warms and illuminates. So he's actually going into the chemistry the chemical composition, basically, or the material composition of the sun and the moon. And the bottom surface of the lunar disk is comprised of uh, the moon beloved pearl, the whole is water pearl, and this stone cools and illuminates. So there's an actual uh, physical mechanism in place also to explain the apparent um, warming and cooling effects of the sun and the moon. And this is where we actually get into a bit of trouble as translators, because the Chinese and the Sanskrit vocabulary is not necessarily um, consistent um, as far as uh, the Chinese goes for translating the Sanskrit. So in some cases, for example, this water pearl, the identity of the stone is unclear. So that's why I translated it quite literally. Or uh, the moon beloved stone. So we can look at what the Sanskrit says, and that can be ambiguous when we look at the, the dictionary, such as Monar Williams' uh, Sanskrit dictionary. And Paramartha, the earlier translator of the Abhidharma Kosha into Chinese, also translates this differently as well. So uh, as a translator, you may, may, we want to um, give a precise translation, but in some cases, it seems that uh, Vas, or that it seems that uh, Xuanzang and Paramartha might not have actually understood the exact identity of these stones either. So in some cases, Xuanzang is using a direct transliteration of the Sanskrit, like a phonetic transliteration. So um, he's keeping it in Sanskrit. And then in other cases too, um, there's a semantic translation. So it's one of the difficulties as translators. But there was clearly an attempt to explain the apparent heating and cooling properties of the sun and the moon with reference to physical processes. And this is something that Vasubandhu seems to be an innovator doing. So he's trying to offer additional information based on a faithful um, account of the sun and the moon based on the Buddha's testimony. Now, just to summarize what I've said here, 
The early Buddhist literature describes the world of Mount Sumeru and the four continents atop a disc-shaped earth. It's not a solar system, and it's also, um, we would say, geocentric. So the world is at the center of the cosmos, not the sun. This cosmology is attributed to the Buddha himself, and it was conceived of as physical and not figurative or mythological. So this was understood as physically real. And the Abhidharma Kosha takes up this worldview and elaborates on it, attempting to explain how and why it exists as it does. So Vasubandhu shows no awareness of a sphere, spherical Earth or the planets. Uh, that's another important point that up until basically the uh, modern period, uh, the majority of Buddhists in the world believed that the, the world was, was flat and it was Mount Meru in the four continents. So the model of the solar system, uh, the spherical earth doesn't appear in Buddhist literature uh, of antiquity. But still, I want to emphasize that um, Vasubandhu elaborates upon an earlier ancient model of Buddhist cosmology while remaining faithful to it. So he inherited something from the Agamas, and he explains it in great detail. And he also discusses the different viewpoints on this cosmology based on what other Buddhist schools of the time were saying. And he also elaborates his own theories about how things um, probably operate in the world. So it's a very important snapshot of uh, how Buddhists in India view things. And also, by extension, the Chinese Buddhist world and the East Asian Buddhist world inherit this worldview, and it remained consistently upheld up until the modern day. So thank you again for this great opportunity. Okay. Thank you, Jeffrey. All right. Um, uh, we will like we will now like to take a short break. Um, uh, given that we're a little bit over time, uh, I think we want to take a five minute <laughs> break. Uh, and so we'll get started with the, the next two presentations in, in about five minutes. So see you back then. I, we would like to start our fourth presentation by Dr. Uh, Cheng Ken, who is uh, affiliated with the Taiwan National University. The title of his paper is The Transmission of the Abhidharma Sources by Xuanzang and His Disciples. So, uh, Cheng? Yes. You're up. Okay, thank you. Uh, thanks again. Uh, and let me begin by thanking uh, Dr. Main uh, for co organizing this, uh, this uh, exciting event. So, let me uh, share my screen here. So, my uh, the title of my talk today is uh, the transmission of the Abhidharma sources by Xuanzang and his disciples. Here is the outline. In this talk, I focus on two major difficulties with understanding the Abhidharma Kosha Pasya, henceforth I've just said the Kosha, and then illustrate how trans how the translations and the commentaries by the Chinese pilgrim Xuanzang and his disciples proved to be extremely helpful for resolving those difficulties. I shall share with you some of the joys I have had while translating the Kosha. And I conclude by drawing attention to the works by Xuanzang and his disciples, which I believe are extremely useful for better understanding not only the Kosha, but also its larger Abhidharma context. So by now, all of you should already know that the Kosha is not an easy text meant for an for audience with little background. It's not like uh, Plato's dialogues, which ordinary people with no knowledge of philosophy can still follow quite well. The Kosha is, uh, in contrast, a highly technical text representing the combination of a long Abhidharma tradition, as you can tell from Bibek's uh, presentation. So I pinpoint two major aspects of technicality of the Kosha. First, the phrasing itself is highly condensed and difficult to unpack. Second, the doctrines discussed are somewhat obscure and not always easy to follow the argument. And these two aspects are often compounded and hence make the kosha even more difficult to understand. And below, I will give uh, a few examples to showcase such difficulties and then suggest a good way to resolve them. Challenge one, condense the phrasing. So for example, in Abhidharma Kosha uh, Pasha and Abhidharma Kosha verses chapter 1, 41 to 43, uh, 42, where the Kosha discusses the issue of whether the eye faculty, uh, Yangen or Chakshur Indriya, sees an object. 
The main issue there is that there are different opinions about whether it is the eye faculty that sees an object, since the eye faculty itself does not make any judgment about the object. The opponent instead suggests that it is the video consciousness that sees an object. So here is a roughly Xianzhang's translation look like. So I'm not going to read a Chinese passage, but rather I'm going to offer you my tentative uh, English translation as follows. Quote, if so, since the eye faculty does not make a settlement, jiedu, why is it named seeing? Because it sharply observes the various species of matter. It is also named the seeing. If it is the eye faculty that sees objects, then it should also uh, uh, it, it should also see even when other types of consciousness then the visual consciousness operates. It is not the case that I, the uh, eye faculty in all circumstances sees. Then who, namely the eye faculty under which circumstances it sees? It is the homogeneous tongfen eye faculty arising together with the visual consciousness that sees, but not eye faculty in the other circumstances. If so, then let it be the case that it is the video consciousness rather than the eye faculty that sees. No, the video consciousness definitely does not see. Why? Because some masters claim, here is my summary of a long passage. If it were the case that it is the video consciousness that sees, then it should see the object even when they are blocked by a wall. If it is video consciousness that sees, then what would perform the function of cognizing? What is the distinction between see and cognizing? We affirm that there's no difference here because seeing a piece of matter is named cognizing it. For example, certain types of discernment, hui, are named seeing, but they also investigate, jian zi. Likewise, certain types of consciousness are named seeing, but they also cognize, end of quote. So I hope you agree with me that the above passage is difficult to unpack. It reads like a debate back and forth between two parties, but we are not so sure who is talking what. The passage becomes much clearer when we consult the commentary by Pu Guang, seventh century, a disciple of Xuanzang. According to Pu Guang's commentary, the above passage represents a probably imaginary debate between two masters from the Savastivada tradition, namely Vasuban, uh, Vasumitra, who, according to whom it is the sense faculty that sees. So below I will uh, uh, name it a faculty camp. In contrast, we have Tamatrata, according to whom it is the sensory consciousness that sees. And below, I will call it consciousness camp. And Pu Guang uh, clearly parses the passage as follows. So here you see uh, it's, a, it's a back and forth debate between the two camps, starting with the consciousness, uh, the challenge from the consciousness camp. So then uh, I can modify my previous English translation as follows. Consciousness camp, if so, since the eye faculty does not make a settlement, why is it named seeing? And we have the answer from the faculty can, because it, is, it sharply observes the various species of matter. It is also named seeing. And we have the rejoinder from the consciousness group. If it is the eye faculty that sees object, then it should also see even when other types of consciousness, then the visual consciousness operates. Then we have the answer from the faculty camp. It is not the case that eye faculty in all circumstances sees. Then who, namely eye faculty under which circumstances sees? It is the homogeneous eye faculty arising together with the visual consciousness that sees, but not eye faculty in other circumstances. And here follows another challenge from the consciousness group. If so, then let it be the case that it is the visual consciousness rather than the eye faculty that sees. 
And here comes the answer from the faculty camp. No, the visual consciousness definitely does not see. Why? Because some master claim, so summary, if it were the case that it's the visual consciousness that sees, then you should see object even when they are blocked by a wall. If it is the visual consciousness that sees, then what would perform the function of cognizing? What is the distinction between seeing and cognizing? And we have the answer from the consciousness can. We affirm that there's no difference here because seeing a piece of matter is named cognizing it. For example, certain types of discernment are named seeing, but they also investigate. Likewise, certain types of consciousness are named seeing, but they also cognize. And both uh, Delavalis Busan or Pruden's uh, translation and uh, GL Sambo's uh, recent uh, translation found Pu Guang useful. And both translation incorporate Pu Guang's commentary. And in contrast, Yashomitura, uh, as mentioned uh, by Ed discussed uh, in Bibek's uh, representation, Yashomitura's uh, Sputa Arta Abhidharma Kosha Vyakya, uh, which is the only extant commentary on the Kosha written in Sanskrit turns out to be not so helpful because it is not so clear that this whole passage from the Kosha was a debate between, two, uh, between those who claim it is the eye factory that sees the object versus those who claim it is the eye consciousness that sees the object. And second, the names of Basu, uh, Basumitra and Tamatarata do not appear any, uh, in, in uh, Yashumitra's uh, commentary on this passage. So in my opinion, Pu Guang might have preserved an interpretation that became unknown in later Indian Buddhism, which I think make uh, Pu Guang's company even more valuable. And there are more good news, namely uh, there are uh, uh, several other commentaries on the Kosha by Xuanzang's disciple. So we have Pu Guang here and followed by Fa Bao, it's a long commentary and Yuan Hui's long commentary and Shen Tai's uh, relative short and incomplete commentary. And then finally Duning's uh, uh, long commentaries. And I suggest that we try to consult all those commentaries while studying the Kosha. So let's move to challenge two, obscure doctrines. As uh, briefly touched uh, both by Bibek and by uh, Bruce, a major reason why the doctrines discussed in the Kosha are sometimes obscure is that the Kosha mixes the doctrines from the Savastivada, Suiqi Yopu, and the South Randika, Jinyangbu traditions. According to the biography of Vasubandhu attributed to Palamarta Zendi, Vasubandhu followed the orthodox Savastivada doctrines when he composed, uh, composed the verses of the Kosha, but when he later composed the prose commentary, namely the Ampidama Kosha Pasha, he sometimes deviated from the orthodox Savastivada doctrines by following the South Randiga doctrines. However, it remains somewhat mysterious regarding what exactly the South Randiga tradition was. The most famous Buddhist epistemologists, such as Tignaga and Tamakirti, are often regarded as South Randigas which uh, speaks to the importance of this uh, tradition. And South Randika criticizes the Tsavasivada and paves the way towards Yogacara Buddhism. But again, we really don't know much about it. And Kosha turns out to be the best sources uh, uh, to understand what the South Randika views are. And Xuanzang, for example, Xuanzang's translation of the Kosha mentions the term Jingbu on South Randika. 20 times. And furthermore, uh, Xuanzang's translation of the Nyaya Anusara uh, by Sankapatra Zhongxian is invaluable because it provides further clues about the South Randika views. The Nyaya Anusara defends the orthodox Savasivada doctrines and criticizes the Kosha whenever the latter adopts the South Randika positions. For example, the Nyaya Ansara mentions the author of the Abhidhamma Kosha by the term Jingzhu, uh, meaning scripture master, more than 200 times, and the name South Randika Jingbu more than 30 times. And in its criticism, the Nyaya Ansara usually uh, provides more details than what is said in the Kosha and hence sheds lights on the Kosha. 
Below, I give two examples to highlight the criticism on Kosha and also of the earlier South Atlantic masters such as uh, Shirilada by the Nyaya Amsala. 2A, according to Savastivada tradition, the linguistic elements such as names, sentences, and syllables are real entities, dharma, belonging to the dharmas that are neither material nor mental. It's the citta vipurita sanskara dharma. But in contrast, according to the kosha, names, sentences, and syllables are merely variation of sounds. They're called, it's called a, a kosha vishesha, and hence are not real entities. And Nyaya Amsara criticizes the kosha position and defends the orthodox Savasvada doctrines. And to be, uh, uh, Nyaya Anusara also sheds light on the early history of South Randiga by criticizing <laughs> the early South Randiga master Shri Lada around 4th century CE. Nyaya Anusara contends that if, according to Shri Lada, everything stays only for a moment, namely momentariness, then the mental consciousness, which does not arise until the moment T3, cannot cognize the external object that exists only at T1. If the mental consciousness does not cognize any external objects, then the memory of a previous cognized object would not be possible because it is the mental consciousness that keeps the memory. But since memory is a fact that everyone agrees upon, the South Atlantic position is untenable according to Sankapatra. So here is the illustration of the epistemological difficulty uh, pinpointed by Sankarpatra against uh, Shuryada. So we have a T1 external object uh, uh, as a cause, but the, uh, at T2, uh, there arises the sensory consciousness as an effect. But if everything is momentary, uh, then the mental consciousness which arises only at T3 cannot serve as the effect of the cause. Uh, of uh, external object, which stays only at T1. And a final remark about Xuanzang's translation, as mentioned earlier by my colleague Bibek, in addition to the Abhidhamma Kosha and the Nyaya Sala, Xuanzang's translation of the Abhidhamma Kosha uh, of the Abhidhamma also includes the foundational text of the Sabasivada tradition before the Kosha, in particular, the Abhidhamma Nyana Prasthana and its six subordinate texts and second, uh, uh, the Mahabhivasha. And the importance is this, Xuanzang's translations are the only version we have and hence provides the only access to those central texts of, of the Savasivada school. Comparing the translations by Xuanzang, we can trace the development and changes among those Savasivada texts. For example, the arrangement of chapters vary among those texts. So here is a chart of the chapters. In, uh, in the first uh, uh, column, uh, in the first row, we have Abhidhamma, uh, Nyana Prasthana and Mahavipasa. And then uh, we have Abhidhamma Kosha Pasha. It's a very different arrangement of chapters. And the uh, Bibek already provides some, uh, some reasons uh, for why the Kosha arranged the chapters in the way it is. Okay, so finally, I want to briefly address uh, what are the joys with translating the kosha. I uh, uh, briefly provide two points. First, given the complexity and obscurity of the kosha, we have to look for missing pieces, namely hidden hypotheses here and there. For me, this is a real intellectual uh, treat. And second, as mentioned earlier by my colleague Bruce, Xuanzang was a very learned scholar and had already translated several Abhidharma texts before he embarked on translating the Kosha. It is very interesting to monitor how he translated it and interpreted the text. Uh, we should bear in mind that translation is also an interpretation. So for example, towards the end of the passage quoted earlier, there's a sentence. For example, quote, for example, certain types of discernment, Hui, Pranya, are named the seeing, but they also investigate jianze, bra jia na di. So here you see I highlight these uh, two Sanskrit terms because there's a playing of words here. Because the verb bra jia na di and the noun bra nya are cognate. So literally the sentence means certain types of discernment, 
uh, name the scene, but they also discern, which sounds like just repeating itself. To avoid the repetition and make the sentence clearer, Xuanzang here deviated from his convention and translated or interpreted, if you will, Brajanadi in terms of Jianze, investigate, whose common Sanskrit correspondent is Brabijaya, uh, from the root Brabi plus Ji, but not from Bratnya. And there are many examples like this. For me, it is very illuminating and enjoyable to ponder on why Xuanzang chose the term used. And my colleague Wei Zhen will say more about Xuanzang's translation shortly. So I'll conclude, in conclusion, in this talk, I pinpoint two major aspects of technicality that makes it difficult to understand the kosha. I suggest that it would be very useful uh, to consult the Chinese translations and commentaries by Xuanzang and his disciples. And I hope to draw more attention from you, uh, the, the audience, to the value of Chinese Abhidharma sources, which are extremely helpful for shedding lights not only on the culture itself, but also on the larger Abhidharma context. Thank you so much for your attention. Okay, thank you, Jing. Um, all right, so next we have uh, Wei Jing Tang who is affiliate, uh, Dr. Wei Jing Teng, who is affiliated with Dharma Drum Institute of Li Liberal Arts, also in Taiwan. The top uh, title is a comparison of Xuanzang and Paramartha's translation of the grammatical uh, elements in the Abhidharma Kosha. Okay, Wei Jian. Yeah. Great, oh, greetings to friends and audience. Also, thank you, Jessica, for helping hosting this symposium. So, um, the issue I will be um, I'll be addressing in my today's presentation rather concentrated and smaller in its scope compared to my uh, colleagues' presenta uh, presentations we have seen we have just seen. I deal with a rather technical issue re relating to our modern translation of the medieval Chinese Buddhist translations of the century text in general and Xuanzang um, and, and Xuanzang's translation in particular. So uh, in, in the translation of Sanskrit text into European languages, the Sanskrit, uh, the Sanskrit grammatical expressions would quite naturally be translated into their European equivalents, since those languages share common ways to express the grammatical elements such as nominal declension, verbal conjugation, participles, and so on. But it's not the case, I mean, not quite naturally the case for the medieval translators of, of Buddhist texts in, uh, in their Chinese translations, because the Chinese language does not share a uh, common way to express grammatical elements. So our first presenter, Vivek, uh, already pointed out this. So in our translation of medieval Chinese translation of Buddhist century texts, we would like to know if the Sanskrit grammatical expressions were identified by the medieval translators of Buddhist Sanskrit texts in their Chinese translation, if yes, we uh, the modern translators should recognize and uh, uh, that those Chinese expressions are grammatical expressions rather than conveying their uh, original semantic meaning. So um, taking Xuanzang and Paramahansa's translation of Abhidhamma Kosha Bhasha, this study, um, my presentation attempt to identify those Chinese expressions of the Sanskrit grammatical expressions in, um, in the medieval Chinese translation for this text, Sanskrit text. But um, before, demonstra uh, before uh, uh, de demonstrate those Chinese expressions of Sanskrit grammatical expressions, I would like to provide some background of the Sanskrit knowledge uh, in the medieval Chinese Buddhist circles. In my previous studies, uh, against some stereotype in impressions, I have shown that it is not the case that the medieval Chinese Buddhists were entirely ignorant of the Sanskrit grammar and, it, and its expressions, particularly after Xuanzang's returning from India. Take for example, um, oh, before Xuanzang's time, the uh, Chinese Buddhist monk scholars doesn't seem to have a clear idea of even the term grammar, that is Vyakarana itself. 
which was first mentioned in Chinese transcript uh, in Chinese transcription Bi Jia Luo, and later revised by Xuan Zhang as Bi Ye Jie La Nan here. The term Bi uh, Jia Luo appeared for the first time in Dharma Kshema's translation of the uh, Mahaparinirvana Sutra, Sutra, probably translated during uh, uh, 414, 420 AD. And based on this description, several later prominent exegists used the, the term Pijalo to compare to some kind of uh, Vipulia text here um, of the Mahayana Buddhism. Xuanzang gave some uh, uh, history of the Vyakarana in, in more details and explained, it as, uh, and explained it that it is actually a work that gives exposition of the knowledge of words, um, i.e. Uh, Shabda Pitya Vyakarana. So uh, let me introduce some of the grammatical terminologies mentioned or, and, and sometimes explained by the medieval Chinese monk uh, Monk Buddhist scholars. Uh, so here, a, for uh, verbal expressions, the, the Chinese have introduced uh, use di and duo for Sanskrit ting and use zhuan or zhuan shen for vipakti uh, and and this bo luo sami uh, for parasmai pada uh, ada moni uh, for atmane and for nominal expressions. The Chinese had mentioned or used sumando for, for, suban, uh, for subanda. And for karakas, the Chinese not only gave uh, the names of Sanskrit karakas here in, transcrip in transcription, but also explained here. Um, so uh, the, uh, the biology of Xuanzang uh, here, the, the karakas, are explained in Chinese as, the, uh, as, as shown here. So, uh, as Vivek noted, that the medieval Chinese Buddhist translators and commentators were probably aware of grammatical terminology, but to what extent they understood and were, and were able to make sense of is another issue which we are not dealing here. And let me uh, introduce some of uh, the uh, more Chinese expressions used by Paramarita and Xuanzang. Oh, uh, before that, sorry. Uh, uh, some other uh, 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 grammatical terminology mentioned in Chinese, uh, medieval Chinese uh, uh, texts. Here, here is the um, uh, mention of, uh, of compounds. So the, the six compounds were transcribed, oh uh, no, uh, explained, sorry, here, as shown. But we don't have time to go into details about this. Uh, so right now, let me introduce some of those Chinese um, um, expressions used by Paramartha and Xuanzang, which I think are the translations of Sanskrit grammatical expressions. Uh, there are some differences in their translations of the Sanskrit grammatical expressions, but in general, their translations are curiously similar or even uh, exactly the same. It is not impossible that Xuanzang kept Paramartha's translations and changed and, and changed those um, he need, when he needed to, since uh, very likely that Xuanzang had access to Paramartha's translation. To explain this, we need to analyze and compare to other medieval translators, which is very likely viable thank, uh, thanks to digital humanity tools today we have. So let me see, uh, let us see some of the examples. Here for the future tense, the character Dang is used to translate the future tense instead of uh, when or should, which are the uh, Chinese indigenous semantic meaning. And for passive voice, uh, the character suo is used to translate uh, the uh, passive voice. For jiren, uh, the character e is uh, uh, to express jiren is placed after the verb, but not before. 
And for past participle, the character e, uh, to express past participle is pressed before the verb. So e sure here. More pa uh, past participles are using e to render uh, to render or translate the past participles. And for future passive uh, passive participles, a parameter use gun here. Uh, we can we see and and Xuanzang use in in gun uh, to render the future sense of the future participle. Uh, and and gun uh, should not be understood as expressing the sense of moreover or uh, furthermore, like in uh, Chinese uh, uh, original uh, semantic meaning. Uh, and for optative uh, verb, the character in used to translate the sense of obligatory should for uh, optative verb, siat here, um, in is not a here, here not in, uh, in contrast to the, 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 the previous uh, future participle in. In here um, is not a grammatical expression. And for nominal uh, cases, we have a passage from Abhidharma Kosha translated by uh, Zhen Di uh, and, and Xuan Zhang. And this passage discuss about what constitutes Atma, uh, Atman self, in the notion of uh, Atma Trusti, which is view of self, Wo Tian. Huh? Does it refer only to Aham or does it also include the idea of mama, right, uh, here. Uh, yes, so um, Masuban to answer for us, uh, Atma Trusti includes both meaning of I and mine. In the view of I, uh, it, I mean, if the view of I is di distinct from the view of mine in the case of Atma Trusti, then the view of by me uh, would be another view, and the view of for me um, would, would be yet another one. The grammatical knowledge involved in this discussion is the operation of nominal case ending. Um, so here we uh, see the four cases of I were given uh, by Xuanzang's disciple Pu Guang. That, uh, Gen Qin also mentioned that in his commentary to Rabbi Damakosha. So as Genqin uh, mentioned, the medieval Chinese Buddhist commentaries are important sources. So, and here we have more uh, examples, oh, sorry. Oh, so this is uh, what Pu Guang, uh, the common, common, commentator, uh, main, uh, explains. And more examples, the, uh, uh, the character Yo is, is used to translate instrumental case and gu. Uh, express reasons to translate ablative case comes after the reason, not as the regular Chinese syntax, which comes before the reason. And um, here, lastly, the compounds. Um, so if, for example, we have a, a compound AB, uh, consists of two words, AB, and, and AB is a genitive uh, Bahuri compound and AB is understood as referring to or qualifying C, yet another word, the word outside compounds. The meaning of the compound AB would, uh, would be like this, C taking A as B or C of which B is A. Sorry about this little. Uh, and Chinese translation uses this uh, style, E, A, Wei, or SB to render the genitive buffery compounds. As in this case, Sarva Anasra Heituka, this buffery compound, and then uh, Paramatha used E, uh, something, something, S. And Xuanzang also used the character S here, Wei. Uh, another, uh, yet another buffery, uh, genitive buffery compound, Dukadi Gocharam, Dukadi Gocharam. And Paramatha translated that the, the, the uh, Dharma knowledge, 
啊、uh, ，which takes desire， 欲苦啊，啊 ，suffering etc. as me, uh, mental object. Here as the Chinese character Wei, and for Xuanzang, uh, the same here. Use Wei. All right. Um, my tentative conclu concluding remarks. It is likely that the medieval, the medieval Ch Chinese translators of some of Sanskrit Bodhi texts were aware of and tried to translate the Sanskrit grammatical expressions into Chinese. The Chinese translations of Sanskrit grammatical expressions could be identified, and therefore we should translate those expressions in terms of their grammatical functions instead of their semantic meanings expressed in the Chinese language. Although Par Paramartha did not uh, uh, leave any uh, expositive, uh, sorry, expository notes on uh, Sanskrit grammatical expressions, unlike Xuanzang and his disciple did. In their translation,、uh, we see here he recognized and translated the Sanskrit grammatical terms. If、uh, the above assumption is plausible, then we can make use. We can use、uh, make use of、uh, some digital humanity tools to run through Paramartha Xuanzang translations, whereas other medieval Chinese translator、uh, translators work. Uh, of the Sanskrit grammatical expressions and produce、uh, maybe a list of Chinese glossaries of the Sanskrit grammatical expressions in a statistically、uh, sounded way and have a better idea of the history of the medieval Chinese translation of the Sanskrit text.、Um, thank you for、uh, listening. That's 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 all my、uh, presentation. Okay, thank you, Wei Jian.、Um... Okay. Well, I I return the floor to you, Jessica. All right. Well, it is.、Uh, I wish I was healthier, but this was very enjoyable. And thank you、uh, to our chair, Professor Ken Tanaka, who、uh, put so much work into bringing this all together. And it's an exciting project to see、uh, how this translation of、uh, a Chinese、uh, text into English、uh, is progressing. So. That's wonderful.、Uh, I would like to thank our audience, all of those folks who、uh, joined us、uh, to listen to these very technical but so necessary、um, presentations about ongoing translation work and about some of the trends and patterns and things that these very、uh, specialized individuals are able to see for us, which is fabulous. I'd like to thank our five panelists.、Um, We've got Vivek Sharma, Bruce Williams,、uh, Jeffrey Kotick,、uh, Ching Kang,、uh, Wei Jing Tang. They、uh, shared with us their expertise and worked together in the lead up to our symposium tonight,、uh, sh sharing ideas and improving on one another's、uh, presentations.、Uh, as I've mentioned in the chat, they are、uh, not only working on this translation together,、uh, but they have graciously offered to post their slides in PDF for anybody interested. We will include these、uh, PDF slides along with an edited video recording、uh, and selected question and answers in text form. So all registered participants will receive a note when these are posted and ready on our site、uh, for your viewing, reading, or listening pleasure. I would also like to thank our partner、uh, for this symposium,、uh, the Bukyo Dendo Kyokai or the BDK. Who are the sponsors of this massive English Tripitaka translation project?、Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank our、uh, generous donor, the Robert H. Enho Family Foundation, our institutional home, the Department of Asian Studies at UBC, my administrative support,、uh, Camila Minuti with the BSc program, and the Asian Studies office staff、uh, for all the help I receive for program activities like this one. Thank you to everyone,、uh, and good night. Stay safe.